Hello, folks. Hello, folks. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Comic Shop Talk Live. Brought to you by Black Cat Comics and Rockin' Milpitas, your one-stop shop for all things superhero. Shop online at black-cat-comics.com. We keep you connected to the comic book community. I'm Mark. I'm Francie. And we've got a fun show for you this week, chock full of this week's comics, maybe a couple last week comics, maybe a couple of vintage comics from eras gone by, because that's what we do. We talk about comics here on Comic Shop Talk Live. It's an interactive program. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you're reading, what you're looking forward to reading, what's at the top of your stack this week. But we always like to start the show with a little... Comic shop news. So the big news is the doors open. Uh, that's uh, big news. And uh, for the first time in a little over a year, we're welcoming back our cats and kittens into the shop. And uh, it's uh, been been a blast. Been great uh, watching uh, life crawl back to normal here in Rock and Milpitas. Uh, we're doing it by appointment. Uh, book your in-store shopping experience at black-cat-comics.com. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. We're all booked up for Wednesday, Thursday, well, every day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, today. Uh, folks taking it as some folks coming back multiple times. So, so now it's been a couple of days. How's it been for you? What, what's what's the takeaway? Oh, the takeaway is I'm, I'm really glad we're doing it like this. And I think the folks that have made the appointments uh, feel the same way. Uh, let me say to you folks, because people, you know, why do I have to make an appointment? Why are you doing it like this? Is this just for COVID or what's what's this all about? Well, uh, first of all, we put it all in the newsletter. If you read the newsletter, then then you know all this. And um, give me just a sec while I explain it to the folks who aren't yet subscribed to the newsletter. Uh, you know, it's just about your experience. It's about you having a great time coming into the shop. Um, we wanted to give our customers the opportunity to be able to enjoy everything about being in a comic store and have the place all themselves without being impeded by door-to-door -door salesmen, telemarketers, uh, other customers, people trying to sell me stuff, whatever it might be. Gamers. Um, whatever it might be, uh, good, bad, and indifferent. And uh, so we set up half an hour slots for people to have the place all to themselves, have uh, me as a resource all to themselves. Um, to three friends or family members with you. And uh, so just to give you a little background, we, we just wanted to make it more fun yeah. and, and more accessible for you. Uh, it was a kind of a bold move. It's a bold choice. We weren't sure how the response was going to be. We weren't sure how it was going to work out. Uh, but so far, it has worked out really so well um, for exactly the reasons that I've mentioned. It seems to me that the customers who have come in have really enjoyed being able to walk around, take their time looking at whatever they wanted to look at, uh, ask me all the questions that they want to ask. Half an hour is a long time. Half an hour is a good amount of time when you have the whole place to yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, as a store person, obviously, I want a bunch of people in here buying stuff. Uh, every store wants a bunch of people buying stuff, but take new comic Wednesday, for example, I would have a long line of customers and as a business, that's great. I'm here ringing up customers and selling comics. That's what I'm here to do. But if you're in that line, there are things that you're not enjoying about that experience. Um, you know, you got to get back to work and, and, but you want to ask me what I think about this week's book. You want to ask me if I read that thing from last week, whatever it might be, you have questions, comments, concerns that aren't being addressed because I'm ringing up people and talking to the people in line. Um, so in the absence of me being preoccupied with all kinds of other people, I can give you my full attention. And then, like I say, I think the customers have, have uh, appreciated having the store all themselves, being able to look at in the back issue bin and on the walls and at the toys and, and all over without feeling like they're in somebody's way or without having somebody in their way, et cetera. It's about figuring out how we can bring the best customer experience to you guys. Can we reinvent ourselves post-COVID? Can some light come out of this dark year? Can we Can we improve? And I think... Having this experience, we're calling it an experience because it really is. I mean, it's fun in here. The lights are all on. We got some umbrellas. We got some old books. Like it's a new layout. There's some new stuff. Um, and it's just fun to, you know, check it out without people breathing down your neck or, you know, you worrying about people not having their masks on or what have you. It's it's a nice, safe, 
fun experience. And if you just want to grab your books and go, you can you still, still do totally do that. Grab your books online, grab a curbside, swing on by, grab your books and go. People love that. We love the convenience of that. We love having that available to you. It's but win, if, win, win. But if you are one of the folks who want to spend some time walking around, looking at stuff, experiencing your local comic shop, you can totally do that uninterrupted I for half an hour at a time. More shops should do that. Like, can you imagine if you had like the Apple store all to yourself for like 30 minutes and have one dedicated staff member to walk you through everything? Like how cool is that? That's really cool. You know, I think I've thought about this with record stores. I would love to walk into a record store. I'd love to yes, walk Mr. into Cosby, Amoeba uh, and have a, a, a staff member, like you say, and, and, and not have anybody else around. So I could look in the, in the punk records and then I can look over here in the, in the jazz and whatever else. Um, it's like a concierge service. A kind of a concierge service. And then I can ask this person, you know, blah, 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 because they're the music expert. So so maybe they could help me out. Uh, but, you know, uh, you don't really have that experience too often. So now you do. That's my very long-winded way of saying uh, book your appointment. If you're watching, if you're one of the folks uh, cool. watching who has already made an appointment, uh, feel free to comment um uh, unless uh, you really hated your experience and then keep it to yourself uh no i'm just kidding uh like i say if you've had if you've been here already please let everybody know how your experience was if you haven't booked an in-store experience come on by uh because nobody's been in the shop uh, for a long time and it's it's fun to see your uh squeaky your clean masked yet smiling faces um, so that's kind of the big news. It's been really yeah. great seeing warm bodies back in the store. Love it. Uh, been great uh, just being able to interact with with my people in real life, not just like this. Though, boy, this has been a lot it's of fun. fun. Um, and uh, and again, if folks do, that have made the appointments, uh, folks that come in on Wednesday for their half an hour, if you miss hanging with the locals, then join us here on Comic Shop Talk Live. Be part of the program. That's all good fun. Yep. Um, let's see what other sort of comic shop news. I guess there's a little peripheral comic shop news uh, in the way of local conventions. I'm hearing all kinds of talk about um, the the San Jose Super Toy Show and and uh, East Bay Comic Con, East Bay Comic Con, and and different things. Um, Daniel, I had an appointment earlier today, and it was like the store was never closed. It's awesome. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. It was great to see you. It was great to see you back in the shop. Great to hang out again. Um, that's <laughs> uh, that's fun. Yeah, there's so talk of shows. Yes, back on the. I on don't the know of any specific dates, uh, but I I will throw it out there a little bit. Like we said last week about Free Comic Book Day, get ready, folks, because much like our door being back open, the shows are coming back. Coming free back. Comic Book Day is coming back. <gasps> We're gonna do Swap Meet again. Um, swap Meet yeah, Pre Comic Con Comic Con is gonna me. come back. Rock and Mill Peters Pre Comic Con Ugh. Comic Con. The uh, Halloween spooktacular, yes. uh, all the all the great stuff that you know, love, and remember um, is is coming back. So get ready. I always encourage you guys to check out the uh, San Jose Super Toy Show. It's our cool local show. Get out there and support your uh, local comic community. Um, keep up with the events page at black dash cat dash comics .com. We don't have an events page, do we? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Um, we just haven't used it in a long time because uh, there There's haven't no been events. events. <laughs> uh, but the events are coming back, so we got to hit refresh on our events page, uh, and that's where we'll post dates and, and things when when they all get nailed down. Uh, but as you can see, I'm super excited to uh, to be just getting the comic book industry back in gear. Um, we survived. I've said a thousand times. Uh, Thank you all so much. Uh, even if you are not shopping at our store, uh, whatever store you're shopping at, thank you for keeping comics going yes. over this last year. Uh, mm -hmm. We here at Black Cat Comics and every other comic store everywhere uh, appreciate still being open, still being able to uh, serve our customers and sell comics. And so thank you all very much for your support. Um, and uh, like I say, get ready to, to, to put on your dancing shoes because because the whole thing's getting back in gear and that's fun. I have some news. Do you? Yes. I'm halfway done with the script for Black Cat Chronicles number two, Port Chatham. Awesome. It's super creepy. Because Alaska is super Alaska creepy. Alaska is messed up, dude. There's some weird stuff that happens in Alaska. So in the comic book world, there are two places you should never go. Never go to a wedding and never go to the circus. 
For God's sake, if what? you wake up in a comic book universe, do not go to the circus. You will die. <laughs> horrible, horrible things happen at comic book circuses. Uh, ask Dick Grayson, ask Dead Man, oh. ask the Ringmaster. Uh, there's an image That's of funny. the Hulk dressed like a clown. Even the Hulk will tell you, don't go to the circus and don't go to weddings. And in real life, God bless you, Alaska. That's Alaska. Don't go to Alaska. You'll you'll go missing. You'll get eaten. You'll be abducted by aliens. Something something will happen to you. Um, and since you're not going to Alaska, you can pick up Black Hat Chronicles number two and read all about it yourself, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we're shooting for August, so we'll we shall see. I'm getting the Kickstarter together. Hopefully by the end of this month, if not this month, early early June. So. Keep an eye out for that. Without spoiling anything, and you don't have to talk about the Chatham part, what's the creepiest thing in your in your research? What's the creepiest thing about Alaska that you've come across? There are multiple secret, hidden, underground military bases. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> there you go. Just an example of the many crazy things in Alaska. Um, so that's good fun. I'm really excited about that. I know they're all excited to be, uh, to get the second issue. And, um, like I've said before, we're shooting for quarterly. Uh, there might even be a second title getting ready to roll out. Um, black cat, black dash cat dash publishing.com is, uh, the other site besides uh, black cat comics that you should be frequenting and getting all the cool info. Good times. Good times. So shall we get into this week's comics? Top of the stack. Again, want to hear from you. Want to know what you're reading, what you're looking forward to reading, what's at the top of your stack. What's at the top of your stack this week? There's a couple different things. Um, I love all things Mike McNola, Hellboy, Witchfinder, all of that. Yes, please sign me up. So this is just one of um, the new kind of minis. I think there's three issues coming out. And it is the House of Lost Horizons. And it's basically um, some sub characters from Witchfinder. So, you know, if you read Witchfinder, you know who these people are already. Um, paranormal, mystery, you know, weird stuff happens. And so, yes, I, I that's totally my wheelhouse. Um, so this is created by Mike Minola, script by Chris Robertson, who is like the co-author of all things Mike Minola. An art by Leila de Del Duca. Let's see if I what I can show you. So this art isn't as dark as some of the other Hellboy universe type stuff. There is no Hellboy in here, but it's kind of got that BPRD ish flavor. If you're into that stuff, I'm into that stuff. And it's also like the you know the Miskatonic that came out. Um, a little bit ago with Image Comics. So that kind of same era and that same kind of genre flavor. Good stuff. I also love anything it's Mignola. Five, five shots. Uh, anything that at the top says uh, from the world of Hellboy. Yes. Yes, please. Um, because it's crazy. that they've they've earned my trust and and you can't always say that about everything even things you might like a lot but but the mignola verse has earned my trust and one thing i always look forward to is that what you mentioned is that sort of genre fusion it's 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 a little bit horror a little bit mystery uh, a little bit paranormal. superhero a little bit paranormal crime. uh yeah a little bit crime noir he's it, it's like a perfect mix of, of and period. all the, I like period um, stuff. And, and then even a little bit of humor, you know, it's all like super dark and then he gets punched in the face says, oh crap. And, and somehow that makes you laugh. Uh, like I say, Mignola puts uh, Chris Robertson uh, puts, puts a little bit of everything into their work. And I, I appreciate that kind of thing. I love all of that. All of those things. Yes. Um, at the top of my stack. Okay. Just half a second. Let me say this is cover of the week. Look at that cover. Uh, not just because it's Black Cat and we're Black Cat Comics, but and I could go on about the title. It's a good title. It's a fun book to read. Um, but uh, but just I just had to throw that out there. Uh, I love it when a comic book is worth the cover price. I love it when you look at a picture and you say, "Yeah, I'll pay four ninety nine for that." I don't care about the other twenty two pages. Okay, bonus question mm -hmm. uh, for our audience here. What Disney ride does this remind you of? 
What Disney ride? Anyway, super cool cover. While you ponder the trivia question, I'll move on to what is at the top of my stack this week, and that's the latest issue of Fantastic nice. Four. I warned you last time to jump into Fantastic Four. I think this is number 32. See. I told you number 31. Grab number 31 uh, because you you want to get primed for this one. The Bride of Doom, it says on top there. I've been going on and on about Fantastic Four. It's it's as good as it's been in a long, long time, which says a lot because when I say names like Mark Wade, J. Michael Straczynski, um, on and on and on, I could go. Uh, Marvel's had their best talent, their best writers on this book for as long as I can remember, and every arc, every writer is as good as the next. Uh, but but what's going on right now is just quintessential Fantastic Four. It gives you that that vibe that from the Lee and Kirby issues from the John Byrne era, and and that's just the two highest compliments I have. Uh, the art is stellar, Let's see it. and uh, it's uh, it's just a really Ooh, it's so colorful. It's very colorful. Ooh, that's cool. Um, it's just a neat mix, as I've been saying. It's you know, Fantastic Four. It's it's a family book. There's kids in this book. It's it's not necessarily edgy or hardcore, but it's fun. And there's there's lots of character development. It's lost in space with superheroes, um, and that's exactly what the book is right now. It's just total sci-fi action. Um, there's uh, and it's a family book. You get a little. Uh, uh, you Dynamic. know, Ben and Alicia, Alicia and a little bit of uh, Reed and Sue and there's kids and there's this and that, but that's doom. The second greatest villain in all of comics behind the Joker. Uh, and, and who Dark would side. marry doom? Who would doom marry? Why is this even happening? Um, and, and then, and, and it has a little duel between doom and Reed Richards, unlike any battle you've seen between the two of them ever. And Lord knows we've seen, hundreds and hundreds of battles between Reed and Doom. All I can go. It's just a really, really fun book. Uh, if you were ever a, a Fantastic Four fan, it's a great time to come back. If you're just a Marvel fan, this is this arc is, I think, going to have ramifications and is going to be one of those things people talk about. Uh, and like I say, it's just a fun book with great stories, great art. Does he take off his mask? Um, I, can't, I can't answer that. Um, <sighs> Hashtag. Even if he does, they never show you his face. Um, in, in all my years, they, they show you Doom's face one time, and that's in the original Secret Wars number 12. Um, and uh, In the first movie, he took his mask off all the time. Yeah. Well, the, I mentioned that thing in Secret Wars because he has fixed his face. So the only time they show you his face is when it's not all jacked up. Um, but anyway, Fantastic Four. I know I have a lot of favorite books. Every week I tell you something is my favorite book. Captain America. Um, and it's always true. Uh, but FF has always been one of my favorites. And right now, it likes to say, right now it's it's as good as, uh, as it gets. So check out some Fantastic Four. Next on my list. Next up. Four Shack. Mm. Tom King. Any and all things Tom King should be on your list. The guy's a genius. Um, Superman Up in the Sky. I haven't read that yet. Do we have that? Um, it's it was digital only and is coming to print. Uh, it was just it came Walmart in trade paperback. First? Yeah, it's one of those Walmart um, print and then digital. No, it was digital and then it was in the giant, the Walmart giant size thing, and now it's a trade paperback. Now we can ha consume it. Um, so yeah, I got to add that one to my list. So um, Warshack, it's hmm, how do I explain it? It's um, Warshack. It's Warshack. So it's kind of a detective, kind of FBI, conspiracy stuff. Uh, the two main um, characters are just weird and messed up and like, what's really going on? And is this really all about psychoses or is there something underlying going on? So it's um, CSI, FBI, CIA meets crazy serial killers. And who doesn't love crazy serial killers? Yeah, it's good times. Um, and then let me show you some of the art without spoiling anything. Well, that's good. Ooh. All right. Well done. Kind of muted colors, not uh, super in your face, a little bit. Well, I can't show you that. That's kind of a spoiler right there. Um, but yeah, it's good stuff. I like the you know different kinds of layouts that they're playing with, which is great. That's kind of fun. 
So yeah, Rorschach, top of my stack this week. That would be pretty late in the run now, right? That's number yeah. eight, only a few to go. Yeah, out of 12, there's four more to go. Um, okay, that is going to send me on this week's tangent. Uh -oh. um, because this is written by Tom King. And if you watch any of our videos, you know we always rave about anything Tom King, like Rorschach, uh, Batman, Batman Catwoman, Catwoman might be my favorite DC book so right now. Um, except so Superman, good. Batman's man catching up fast. Mr. But, Miracle is still um, like up there. Uh, so my tangent Share this week, we've been talking about writers or uh, artists and, and the subjective nature of art, the different styles of, of artists and our favorite artists and whatever. Uh, one of my guys that doing his in-store appointment this week, I was asking me about writers um, because, you know, there are lots, as I always say, there's lots of reasons people collect comics uh, for the new folks and the old schoolers. I always encourage folks uh, to follow comics by creator. If you like a writer, you'll like whatever they do. If you like their Spider-Man, uh, read their image book. Uh, and and yep. following creators is a great way to read and collect comics, uh, whether and they're writers. And introduce yourself to different genres, different publishers, different styles, different artists, etc. For sure. Um, whether it's writers or artists, it's, it's, and so. His question was, you know, you obviously I'm, I'm an old guy, so I know all about the old guys. We talk about Chris Claremont. You'll hear me talk about John Byrne 90 times a show. Oh, wait, um, we're 21 and, minutes uh, in before you mentioned John Byrne. Um, and uh, Marv Wolfman and, and, and all these guys that Len I go Ween. on and on, Len Wein and, and all the greats that we all know and we all know and we all love. Um, and so his question was, well, what about the new guys? What new writers are you liking? What, who are the, where, who's the new Marv Wolfman? Who's the new Len Wein? And there isn't one. Let me just be clear about that because, because all time greats are all time greats for a reason. But uh, again, my tangent this week is, is a little bit about writers to these points. Read anything from Tom King uh, because Tom King is one of those guys that gets the medium. There are lots of great writers. Being a great writer doesn't necessarily make you a great comic book writer totally because different. comic books yeah. is a very specific medium. And, and so there's, there's all kinds of things that exist in the consumption of a comic that don't exist in a novel or in a short story or in a screenplay or in whatever have you. So uh, again, there are certain writers that just get it. One of those guys for me is Chip Zdarsky. Uh, if you ask me who's one of the new writers that, that you love, his name is Chip Zdarsky. I bring him up because he's got two books this week. Three. Uh, there's another one. Um, and, and that brings up what I'm talking about. If, if you like, uh, it, just like it worked when I was a little kid, you're reading a book. This is awesome. And then you go back to the credit box and you see that name and it says, you know, whatever it says written by this guy. So then you go looking for that guy. So I was reading Daredevil, and I was like, this is really good. Who wrote this? Go back, and it's Chip Zdarsky. Later on, I was reading something else totally different. Oh, this is really good. Who wrote this? Chip Zdarsky. So then, like a sensible person, I started looking for his name. So this week, uh, and I already knew he was writing this, but he's doing a book called uh, Spider-Man, Spider's Shadow, which is sort of a what-if kind of book. Uh, this is the second issue. Grab the first one, then grab this one. It, it uh, takes place back uh, around Amazing 300 when Peter first gets the black suit, doesn't yet know it's a symbiote. The pitch is, uh, what if Peter becomes Venom in, instead of uh, uh, Brock? And so, uh, so basically, instead nice. of losing the symbiote, Peter keeps the symbiote and becomes Venom. Um, and, and what does that look like and what happens? Nice. Uh, I love what if books. And, and like I say, Chip Zdarsky is one of those guys that get it, gets it. He's a comic book writer. He knows you want to see character development. He knows you yeah. want to see action. He knows you want to see a couple of nods to the history of the character. Um, he gives you what you want. He gives you what you weren't expecting and he makes it fun and exciting. So, uh, saw Chip Zdarsky's name on the book. So I checked it out. Uh, and then because I like him when I saw him now, yes, you know me, I would have bought the book anyway because it's got Superman on the cover, but seeing Chip Zdarsky on, uh, was writing this one. Yep. That went into my stack. I didn't need to know the premise. I didn't need to know that it, it was a justly book. I trust that, that, that Chip's going to give me a book that I want to read. Um, and much like uh, an artist, you know, you like Todd McFarlane. So you buy whatever Todd McFarlane does because you like his art, you know, he's going to deliver. 
writers work the same way. Uh, if you like the way they handled that character in that one story, you'll probably like the way they handle the other characters in the other stories. Uh, so uh, just putting that out there, uh, track down Chip Zdarsky. Read either one of these books. Like I say, grab the first issue and then this week's number two. This is the first issue of Justice League uh, Last Ride. And uh, like I say, if you don't know Zdarsky, um, and then after you read these two and you learn to love them like I have, then go back and do the same with the trade paperbacks. Uh, search his name and read his Daredevil and read read the other stuff, Spider-Man and, yep. and whatever, because uh, that's what makes comics fun. Yeah, along the same lines, Tom Taylor is another one of my hot favorites. So he's doing Batman the Detective. This is issue two out of six. So they're doing little minis. Um, so he did Deceased, which I loved. Um, that was some of the best writing. And again, we've talked about speaking of Justice League. It's so hard to do team books and yet have everyone have a voice, a spot, get the characters right. And he did that in spades with Deceased. So anything Tom Taylor, he did the Hellraiser, Rise and Fall, three shot, large prestige format, which I love. And Hellblazer, I'm really critical about Hellblazer. He did a really great job with that. So same thing. You know, I wasn't super jazzed about the future state stuff, but it said Tom, um, Tom Taylor. So I'm like, yes, I will read that. And it was great. Um, and so now they're, they're continuing on with Batman Detective. Let me show you some art. And uh, wow. I'm a little, because I didn't, you know, do all of the multiverse stuff, I'm a little lost, to be honest. This is really good. This page right here is really good. You can see the detail. Um, great pacing, great art. It's Batman. Like, come on. Yes, take my money, please. Here. Here you go. Uh, while we're talking about writers, why don't you talk about that giant tome you've got there? Oh, yeah. So, ugh, get my workout. In case you missed it, Fables... Um, is some of the best stuff to ever come out of DC Vertigo, maybe just behind um, Sandman, if you like, fantasy storylines. So Fables, for those of you that don't know, is it's done. It was 150 issues um, by Bill Willingham and Mark Buckingham and Steve Lealoha, local guy, Steve Lealoha. Um, and it's basically what happens if all of our fairy tale characters were alive and living amongst us in secret. And then mayhem ensues. So that's kind of the gist of fables. And this tome is basically um, 40 issues that would, you know, um, collect like half of the, a third of the story. So ugh, we've got, I think, the first one online. And this is the second one that just came out this week. So and that's the whole run. And it's a treat. Totally fun stuff. So if you liked the fantasy aspect of Sandman, um, you would really love Bill Willingham and his his writing and also the Mark Buckingham and Steve Aloha art. It's fantastic. Fantastic. And can I chime in sure. with something that is 90% true? Ugh. I will say this, and there will always be an exception, but here, I'm going to say it anyway. If it comes in a compendium, it's probably worth reading the whole thing. Uh, they don't make a whole lot of phone book graphic novels like this, um, but it has been my at least recent experience that every time I see one of these, it collects an all-time great book like Fables. Um, the quick examples I can think of is Walking Dead. Uh, if for some reason you haven't already started reading Walking Dead, don't buy 32 trade paperbacks. Just buy four big old tomes. When you start reading it, you're going to want to read them all, so you might as well just buy the big phone book. Uh, every issue of Fables workout. is a treat. Every issue. It and is, yeah. and so pick up the two compendiums. It's the whole run. You will not be disappointed. Well, and, and not to just, you know, go gaga over it, but um, so I've been reading comics for 25 years. We've had the shop for 20 of those years. And the only piece of original art that I have is from this series. So that's how much I love it, just to throw that out there. I think that, that says a lot. Yeah. Um, again, what's at the top of your stack? What are you looking forward to reading this week? What have you already read and loved? And who's your favorite writer while yes. we're talking about writers? Writer, artist. Who's Jason your favorite Aaron. classic? Uh, you just stole mine. Um, I'm psychic. 
because, uh, okay, Heroes Reborn, a little like my black cat. This is just like a two second spiel that always turns into a 20 minute spiel. Um, Heroes Reborn, uh, Jason Aaron is the writer for this book. Jason Aaron is one of these uh, writers that I'm talking about. I loved his Thor run. You loved his Thor run. Oh, he did it for years so and good. years, made it his own, and it was brilliant. Again, they're going to be doing big tomes like that of the Jason Aaron run, and it will be worth picking it up. Uh, I mentioned this book for three reasons. One, Heroes Are Born is the current Marvel event book. The gist is it's a world without the Avengers. Uh, the Avengers never were. And uh, so what does that world look like? And uh, and Blade is the one guy who knows how the world's supposed to be and he's setting out to fix things. Uh, so the premise is really cool. I like Marvel event books. I like anything from Jason Aaron. What really caught me was, uh, you might remember, I mentioned this the number one last week because it was Jason Aaron and Ed McGinnis. I love Ed McGinnis. This is Jason Aaron and Dale Keown, uh, oh. who you might remember from Pitt, Come from on. The Incredible Hulk. Uh, Dale Keown is one of those guys who doesn't have a huge volume of work, but you love every single pencil line he it. ever dropped. Um, because a little like writers, oh. um, he's he's a comic book artist. He gives you action, but he maybe this is a little spoilerific. Uh, he gives you the action, he gives you the detail, but he gives you the emotion. He gives you facial expression, and he gives you. Uh, I don't know. He gives you the big things and the little things. And and I just love Dale Keown, and I always have. Um, and so seeing Ed McGinnis on the first issue, then Dale Keown on the second issue immediately makes you wonder, well, what sort of all-time great are they going to have on in, in line for the third issue? Um, so check out some Heroes Reborn. Check out some of those side books. Because, uh, like I say, Jason Aaron is a, is a comic book guy, and, and he does not disappoint. Um, Why are Pokemon cards like crack? What, what is the what's question. the deal? Um, Every other call call is about Pokemon cards. Well, especially now because Target and Walmart have banned them. Why? Uh, because people are getting violent. What? <laughs> so so now those calls will increase even more because people can't oh get them God. at their local Walmart anymore. That's cray cray. Um, Yes, and don't be bringing your pokey violence over here either. Um, <laughs> but they're so knock cute. Knock you in the Snorlax, I will. Um, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. This is like a cute little kid game. It doesn't like, make why? any. Well, it's just like um, the Cabbage Patch oh dolls of, totally of the eighties. Uh, Garbage well, pail kid cards. That's a, well. That was just the first time I remember like moms beating each other up for for a toy for their kid. And, and me thinking, like, my dad wouldn't fight anybody for a Mego doll. Yeah, no. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's it's Pokey Crack, and it just is Pokey what it crack, is. Pokey Crack, the um, new name for it. Crackymon. <laughs> I, I think that's probably better. I like Crackymon. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to step over your toes and move uh, into Star Wars. Um, you have to read Star Wars. Again, last week I pitched War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha. Uh, because it had that amazing art from Steve McNiven. Um, I've been pitching Star Wars from the very beginning since, uh, well, since 1977, but also since uh, before it was cool, since man. When Dark Horse was doing a stellar job on it, and then it came back to my beloved Marvel, and Marvel's been just a little legacy about Fantastic Four. They've had their top talent on these books from day one. So if if you aren't reading a Star Wars book, you're really missing out. And, and now's the time to jump in because uh, or the bounty hunters will cross over through all the stuff. That's what I was going to ask you. And uh, Dr. Afra too. No, because she yes. creates. PBS. No, it's all. Yes. Um, it's it crosses over through everything. Um, Vader, Afra, bounty hunters, the main Luke. Star Wars book. Um, and again, for those of us who aren't following along, what word in the timeline is this? So the gist is in last week's War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha, uh, Boba Fett has just left Cloud City right. uh, with Carbon Frozen Han Solo in the trunk. And, uh, and now every bounty hunter in the galaxy is out to hijack Slave One 
so they can take carbon frozen Han Solo back to Jabba and collect that bounty. Uh, that's what they mean by War of the Bounty Hunters. Now, all the bounty hunters are out trying to kill each other to, to, to get the so biggest... Uh, in between Empire and Return of the Jedi? So it's, yes, it's like five minutes after the end of, uh, of Empire Strikes Back. Yes. And that's how they've been doing this, especially in the main book. This is the second volume of Star Wars. Uh, from from the recent volumes from Marvel. The first one took place right after uh, episode four. So the Death Star blew up, and then here you got your first issue, and it was about them uh, looking for a new base after they had to leave Yavin and before they got to Hoth. Um, and so, and then they filled the gap between episode four and episode five with some great stories. Uh, now they're doing the same thing, filling the between. gap between Empire and Jedi. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, man, they've been doing a bang up job of it. One thing I really appreciate is, uh, they've, they really spotlighted princess Leah, general Leah, uh, over, uh, more so than, than in those original movies. And that's really great. What's up, Julie? Welcome. Um, hi, Julie. Thanks for joining us. I'm in my, uh, one of my frequent star Wars rants. Uh, so pick up last week's war of the bounty hunters alpha, uh, grab this week's star Wars number 13. Oh, that's good. That is good. That's some cool art. Here's some, uh, Luke training. Your stuff is so much more colorful. Mine's like dark and eerie. Well, I mean, that's, that's the genre choice. That's, uh, you know, you read dark and creepy stuff. So that always has more inking, more shadowy pencils. I read a lot of action stuff, sci-fi stuff, um, and frankly, stuff meant for maybe a younger reader. So yeah, there's brighter colors and, and uh, you know, sci-fi stuff always needs big, bright explosions and whatnot. So read Star Wars. Everybody should be reading Star Wars. You should be reading Star Wars Invader anyway. I'm just using this War of the Bounty Hunter stuff to, uh, to harden the pitch. So speaking of dark, and creepy. Um, so Maniac of New York, it's, it's I think, a five-issue run. There's only one more left. This is issue four. It's been great. It's been super violent, <laughs> super crazy. So um, the long and the short of it is, you can see that, the long and the short of it is um, there's a maniac loose in New York, thus the title, and he's preying on people in the subway system, the automated um, subway trains, and um, nobody survives. Anyone that sees him, sayonara. Um, you know, I'll be a little nitpicky here as a writer myself. I want to know more about the character. Like, it's the last three issues are just like slayings and killings and slayings and killings, and which is fine and cool, but like, what's the motivation? Who's this character? Where did it come from? How do we know all of this stuff? Like, why do we care? So, so there's a little, little bit of juice missing. Um, from the writing perspective, which I'm hoping that they will seal up nicely with a bow, the last issue, which should come out in another about four weeks or so. So Main Act of New York, if you like butchering and bloody horror, this is a book for you. <laughs> butchering and bloody horror. That's a butcher and bloody horror right there too. The Joker, yeah. You know, I said I wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to be getting any more of the Tinian run stuff, but he sucked me in because a lot of it is all this is really a book about Gordon, to be honest with you. And mm -hmm. I love me some Jim. Um, That's a good page. Yeah, I can show this one. Um, art's great. I love me some Jim Gordon. And so, yeah, it's this is a, another great book to, to be top of the stack for me for this week. Um, the first I don't think I, I don't think I'm caught up, but the first issue was all about um, Jim coming to terms with the nightmare of his dreams. Uh, what is the one thing that he can't um, let go of? What's the one thing that plagues him at night? What is what does he wake up at three o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat and think about? And it's it's this guy right here. Um, and so it's it's more about the Joker from the perspective and the lens of Jim Gordon, which is a new a new um, way of looking at the characters, which I really appreciate. So it's great. And let's face it, after thousands of issues of Batman and Detective Comics, uh, it's a little challenging to find a new take uh, on the Gordon relationship uh, with the Joker, but but uh, or, or to find something well, fresh 
to do with these two characters is a little challenging, and they've done a good job of it. You get you get a lot of Joker Batman, you get a lot of Jim Gordon Batman, but you don't really get a lot of Jim Gordon Joker. Mm -hmm. So I think that was kind of an, an interesting and, and smart move by Tinian to kind of explore that relationship a little bit more. I think Gordon could carry his own book. I thought he has. that for a long time. Uh, but first, Gotham City Central, right? Uh. No. no, no, Gotham Central wasn't, he was in it, but it wasn't about him. Um, well, it should have been. Well, first and foremost, Gordon has a son and Gordon has a daughter. And it was only very recently that you ever saw the son and daughter intera interact. I, I never quite understood that. Um, but yeah, like I say, there's a lot in that book that's that's long overdue. First you get of, me, Julie. Uh, you get me. I think there are a lot of villains that should have their own book. I've hollered for the Joker to have his own book for a long time. He had his own book in the 70s and only ran like nine or 11 issues. Um, but it's, it's awesome. And and he's clearly a book a villain that can carry his own book. And what's, there are lots of those. What's your favorite Joker story? Oh, boy, that's really tough to say. Uh, one of my favorite Joker stories comes from the Gotham Central book you just mentioned. Um, Not Killing Joke? No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, it's, it's up there, but uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's one of my favorites. Um, there's an issue of Gotham Central. And I'll totally spoil it. Uh, okay, it's like 20 years old. I was old. say, it's a 20-year-old book, and, <laughs> and, and this, this issue isn't why you read the book. You read the book for Ed Brubaker. But anyway... Uh, so the Joker has, is anyway, I'll cut to the chase. The Joker has been arrested. Uh, he's, he's, you know, at, at the, at the precinct, um, uh, he kills the, the cops that have arrested him and, and he, he bursts out of the office and says, someone call the police. There's been a murder. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and just like that, one thing I've always, always said is that the best Joker stories make you laugh out loud at something that's, that's not funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and like I say, they give you the scene of the gruesome murder. He kills these three cops. And then like the next panel is him, you know, delivering the line. And it's just, and it just makes you laugh hysterically. Uh, so, so when I'm asked that question, that's a scene that, that pops into my head a lot. I think. Um, oh, hold that thought. I'll tell another one. While he's doing that, I will share mine. Since he didn't ask me, how rude. Um, Arkham Asylum is my favorite to this day. Uh, the interplay between the Joker and Batman and basically the Joker saying, dude, you created me. I created you. We are the same thing. It was, it's, it's beautifully done. Dave McKean's arc is sick. Um, and I, it's one of my all time favorites. That and like, you know, the prelude to the wedding stuff that Tom mm -hmm. King did where um, <laughs> I love the story. So the Joker is waiting at somebody, somebody, ra somebody's random house. He basically breaks in, ties everybody up in the house and is waiting by the mailbox for the invitation, which he assumes is, is coming to this house. And it's the wedding invitation between Selena and, and Bruce Wayne. And he's waiting for his invitation and the mail comes and, and finally you look at it and it's all this junk mail, but he sees it as a wedding invitation. He's like, Oh my God, yeah, I'm going blah, 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 blah. And this family has nothing to do with the wedding has nothing to do with Selena or Bruce or Batman and Catwoman. It's just this random family that he breaks into their house and waits all day long for the mail to show up. It is so sick and crazy. I love it. So Tom King's Joker stories, love. I do love that because it it, it gives you that tension uh, that, again, a good Joker story should have because you never know what he's going to do next. Right. And so there should be this. And they, they did this right. really well in, in, the, um, in the Joaquin Phoenix movie. Like there are certain scenes where, where you're just sort of waiting for him to do something horrible. And, and the anxiousness of, of you wondering is, is actually worse than, than, than what he actually does. He's one of the best villains, if not the best, because his on, of his unpredictability. Mm -hmm. So when you make the Joker predictable, you don't have the character right. Uh, I think he's easily the best villain. And I said earlier, okay. it goes Joker, Dr. Doom, and Reggie from the Archie books. Do Dark Side. Uh, sorry, I Reggie Reggie edges out everybody else, everybody else, because 
another little tangent. Here we go. Because you never see the episode where Reggie loses. Reggie never loses. Reggie never apologizes. Reggie never gets his comeuppance. Every once in a while, Jughead one-ups him. Come but ups. But generally speaking, Reggie never gets what's coming to him. Um, and, and that makes him different from most other villains. Okay, Seven. so you asked me uh, what one of my favorite Joker stories is. And this is one of my favorite Joker stories. Uh, this is Superman number nine uh, from the post uh, crisis relaunch by John Byrne. Um, because, like you said about about Gordon, you see Joker Batman all day long. But but it was it hasn't been since the 1950s that you ever saw Joker and Superman in the same book. Um, and so in this issue, the Joker gets tired of, of, of that super genius Batman, and he's like, I can go to Metropolis. That guy's not that smart. Uh, he's tough, but he's not smart. So I'll go to Metropolis and I'll do whatever I want because if I can outsmart Batman, I can certainly outsmart Superman. Um, and so what does he do? Uh, he gets a ice cream truck, um, and coats it in lead and he drives around in his lead truck, uh, because Superman can't see lead. And so Joker is oh. under the impression that as he drives around, he's totally smart. invincible. Smart. You think so? But he's wrong. Uh, it's not that Clark can't see lead. It's that he can't see through lead. So now the Joker is driving around in the only thing in Metropolis <laughs> that Superman can't see through. So, of course, he's going to be like, hmm, there he is. wonder what's going on in that lead truck. Probably something no one wants me to see. Love it. Uh, so anyway, it's it's awesome because it's it's. It's the Joker, uh, it's perfectly Superman, um, and it's perfectly John Byrne. It's a self-contained issue uh, that is that is one part, you know, taps into the history of these characters and one part something you've never seen before. So you worked in John Byrne at least twice so far. There you go. I mean, it's not that cover. That's awesome. I have a awesome. question. Yes. So the dark guy that took over the um, gas refineries on the East Coast, is it a reference to the dark side new gods or is it just called dark side do you know i i can't imagine that it's it's that'd it's, be really cool it's coordinated us. but it, it is really cool. cool um and uh to my earlier point you're totally right dark side probably is a solid number four dark side, uh, dark side is is easily one of the all-time great villains of comics love me some dark side um and oh i'm tapped yeah, out i guess that uh Oh, I'll go on one more little thing. As I've been saying, writers and artists, uh, Geiger is a book done by Jeff Johns and Gary Frank. Um, you know these guys from all kinds of things. Um, and so you want to be reading this book. Okay. You know Jeff Johns from all the great DC stuff that you've been loving. You want to read his image book. Uh, if you know Gary Frank from All-Star Superman and from all the stuff that that, that is so brilliant, uh, then you want to read his image book. This is like their first four way out of DC comics, right? They haven't done much outside of DC. So that's I think they've been um, exclusive. exclusive for a long time. And that's uh, much like undiscovered country. Well, was Jeff like Johns that. was like Jim mm -hmm. Lee. Yeah. He was Mr. For DC time. for a long time. Um, I mean, come on. Uh, you so know, Gary Frank, I don't have to show you that. Nuclear waste gone wrong. That's the gist. Just a great example of what we've been saying is if you like their Marvel book, if you like their DC book, uh, follow them to the other publishers, especially to Image, because that's going to be their creator-owned. That's going to be their pet project, their baby, and those are always I got, awesome. I got a little lost in Doomsday Clock, but I, I, you can't hold a torch. Hold a torch? That's not the right phrase, is it? You, you can't um, underestimate his genius with Blackest Night. The Green Lantern stuff? Yeah. Blackest Night is all-time, all-time all great. All-time great. All-time great. Um, so yeah, that uh, I say as we start to wrap it up. Feel free, uh, let us know your favorite writers, your favorite artists. Who's the 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 hot creator working right now that you're super digging? What's at the top of your stack? What are you looking forward to next week besides Batman Fortnite number three? Oh boy, that's been a huge hit. Um, so go to black-cat-comics.com, click on shop, click on new this week and take a look at all the books that we've been talking about because there was lots of great stuff this week. Tons. Lots and lots of good books out. Yeah. Uh, then tune in uh, next Wednesday, watch the video, check out the newsletter, uh, pick up your books, either curbside shipping or in an in-store experience. And then you read them throughout the week. You tune in on Saturday and we talk about them because it's comic shop talk live. 
That's all we got for you for this week. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time in a brand new show. Bye.